um, how often should they adjust the clock and um, how long they can rely on the clock before asking for uh, basically a, a new update. So um, why are we doing this? Well, uh, the, the motivation, you can break it down into uh, like various things like such as like decentralizing uh, like services, synchronizing, like basically synchronous distributed systems. I'll go in details as we go with the presentation uh, or like correcting basically sequence of processes uh, like managing and predicting congestion, um, like certain uh, like types of let's say metrics and diagnosis. And we have also um, authentication and security, which always becomes an, a, like, a, like an important thing. Like when you have the, basically services that are distributed where you're trying to have um, like reliability and uh, accessibility versus security. So you have to always like uh, find um, a good balance between the two. And uh, more importantly, like uh, which, is, which was basically uh, the motivation, let's say at least in Facebook, like what we were looking for this was like fast and robust consensus. So when you have databases, you need to have consensus between all the databases uh, when you're writing something. And I will like uh, get into the presentation more in details about that. And also accurate logging of events. And um, like, let's say when something goes wrong, you, 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 wanna, you wanna spot where something like I don't know, went wrong and then you can find from the logs. So the logs will make, make uh, they will have meaning between machines, no longer just one machine. And also you have like failover and redundancy, let's say, because we are, uh, we are serving like, I don't know, billions of users. So we need to have always redundancy in services. You can you know, no longer just rely on one machine to do one thing. So that's why, you require to have like these uh, failover things. And um, after all, like all these things are considered basically real-time systems. And uh, again, like uh, an overarching uh, concept is basically a coordinated process of independent systems. So uh, a little bit into distributed systems. Why made distributed systems? So you are obviously familiar with your PC, you're doing certain things and um, you can imagine now you connect your PC, let's say over the network, and then let's say another colleague, sibling, or you name it, like we'll use the computer, we'll log in remotely. And then let's say, I don't know, some another sibling, another colleague uh, logs in, and then let's say you have three, four people using your machine. And then slowly you're like, okay, mm, time to upgrade the machine. And you upgrade the machine, you make it stronger, you have more people using it and so on. But then if this number keeps growing to, let's say, a service like Google, Amazon, Facebook, you no longer can put one machine to do that. So you go for a distributed machine. So distributed machine, we basically call it in our terminology, hyperscale. Like in hyperscale, you're talking about, uh, let's say, uh, millions of machines, let's say, in a data, in a, in like a data hall. So uh, what it brings for you is basically uh, it allows you to have the scalability. So you no longer need like a super powerful computer. You have a lot of little computers that are connected together, but they are sharing the same service. So the overall, like for the user, everything looks seamless as one big machine that is allowing everyone to basically interact in a way as if it is one unified machine that can serve everything. And also it's a reliability. Like, uh, it happens time to time, but it's very like seldom like that you, I don't know, try to log into uh, Facebook or Google or something and service doesn't work. It happens, but it's not supposed to. So that's why we have redundancy. We have even this geographical distribution. Let's say, I don't know, you have a region with a global power shutdown. It's okay. We have another data center, let's say in Europe. We have like all over the globe, you have dif different data centers, so they will kick in. And also is the accessibility. So no matter what we do, like with the time and accuracy and everything, latency is still a problem. Like you're like transferring information from one side to the other side of the planet, let's say if you're, if you, let's, if you had, let's say one uh, data center. So you will have latency and latency will become a problem, let's say 
when you have more users and so on. So that's why it, it is important to have this distribution, like ge ge uh, geographical distribution of your system. And again, uh, there's also adaptability because let's say uh, a certain, let's say, um, region in the world, all of a sudden you have, like, let's say, a certain video or a certain content becomes more, um, goes more on demand. So you move this content there and you serve there rather than, let's say, uh, occupying the transatlantic cables or something. And cons, I make the, there are a lot of cons, uh, such as feasibility and more importantly, the complexity. So like one service that you are basically offering to the user becomes a nightmare now because we have to, you have to figure out how you're gonna break this into pieces that you can uh, like serve, let's say, again, millions if not billions of users. So uh, a little bit from a um, systems perspective, uh, and we have Dr. Kinsner here, and I make pretty much everything I learned about digital logic is from Dr. Kinsner. So you have combinational circuits, and you have uh, sequential circuits, that's like very basics. But then on, uh, as a subset, and you know, like sequential circuits are a subset of combinational circuits, right? And then as a subset of sequential circuits, you have real time systems. So in sequential circuits, we have this notion uh, of logical clocks. So when you have events, let's say uh, in a simple system, like just a finite state machine, you have basically the state which is a logical clock. It, it, like it, it's basically the step. You have, let's say, um, uh, an instruction of doing, let's say, I don't know, an IKEA furniture you're putting together. And there's, there's certain instruction like you have to follow. And let's say you're doing it with another fellow because we are working on a distributed system. So you have to work on these logical steps in a sequence in order to put things together in the right time, in the right manner. And you cannot, let's say, I don't know, start assembling the last parts of something while the other fellow is like starting somewhere else. You may have some conflict if, like, if you're, if you're lucky that it's not requiring anything, like it's a system that is all total parallel, then it's fine. But if it's a system that, uh, in which most cases we have, like in our systems, there is a relationship between these, um, like, uh, things coming together, then you need to follow certain sequences. So therefore, you, you go with an order, like again, this logical clock. And opposed to this, not, not necessarily opposed to this, like an improved version of a logical clock is a physical clock that let's say now, let's say you and I, let's say we're working on this, uh, assembling this furniture or something. And instead of checking constantly with each other, did you finish part A? Yes, no, part B, part C, part D, we go like this. Instead of this, we just set with each other so that, hey, uh, let's set our times. Okay, our times are fine. Uh, let's finish every step, let's say in five minutes, and I will get back to you in 20 minutes. So let's say four or five steps like will be passed. So this is uh, basically the difference between logical clock and a physical clock. So there is a physical, let's say time related to this clock is no longer just like a counter. So um, you can disseminate this time in a network, let's say, with a separate uh, connection, like uh, for example, like well, how are we have it like in this long wave radios, like you have these clocks that they can uh, synchronize with some uh, specific frequency, or you have like the GPS or GNSS more general, or you have systems called like IRIG B, which you set a clock in your entire network, and then you're disseminating time over this clock. Every one of these systems, they come with their own challenges. And uh, let's say such as, for example, in IRIG B, the length of the cable matters because speed of light is now important if you're like, let's say, dealing with nanosecond and so on. Um, let's say GNSS, you need to have open sky uh, requirement. I don't long wave radio, same thing. You have to be in a place that you have the waves there. You have to make sure you're not getting the jam. You have to also consider the distance you have to the repeater or all kinds of things. Uh, opposed to this, we have um, over the basically over the network, uh, over packet network uh, protocols such as NTP and PTP. So NTP, um, again, a comparison between NTP and PTP. So NTP, uh, as in stands for uh, network time protocol is 
is an old protocol, like it's, a, it's one of the uh, old protocols from, I don't know, say one of the only protocols from the 80s that is still around. It went through like say four different uh, revisions. Uh, we have right now NTP uh, version four. And um, it does a great job. Like you have basically these stratum clocks and uh, you uh, like you usually like as this the regular users, I can make, I think every, like some of you can remember the, the days like where we had to uh, tune or clock, let's say in the computer from the BIOS or something. And then all of a sudden computers start to be synchronized always like magically. So the magic was basically your computer uh, communicates with the NTP server and usually you have like them in a hierarchy. So you talk to a stratum three usually. And then um, a stratum three synchronizes with a stratum two and stratum one. And then let's say like stratum zero are basically the atomic clocks. And I mean, they, go, they have their own protocols and everything. So this is not bad. However, uh, the, the, the accuracy is in the range of let's say 10 milliseconds all the way up to sometimes seconds even. And you don't have a guarantee over it. So then we have these applications, let's say control systems or I don't know, databases, uh, which they require uh, not only tighter timing, they require also a reliable way to uh, get to this synchronization. So we're talking about, let's say, uh, tens of nanoseconds to, let's say, um, 10 microseconds. And in some cases, like PTP is going down even into picoseconds. Uh, let's say we're working with uh, colleagues from, the, uh, from CERN, from the Large Hadron Collider. And they have, uh, they basically have a, a, a derivation of PTP with something called white rabbit. And they are going in picosecond range, basically with the, with the same concept of PTP. So um, there are various software imp implementation. We don't need to go through them here, but we come back now to PTP. What is special about PTP that let's say NTP doesn't have and why just like basically asking time over network uh, becomes such a big challenge and we need like basically uh, anything better than NTP. So the short answer is two words, uh, and that is hardware timestamping. So what is hardware timestamping? I think you guys are familiar with the OSI model. So in OSI model, we have seven layers from the physical layer in a network all the way up to basically the operating system. So if you are doing, let's say, um, just like using like an ordinary uh, off the shelf network. Uh, packets basically get transmitted over uh, the physical layer. They go through the Mac, they become basically, the packets like go through their, their error checking and everything and so on. They basically get routed with on the IP layer and then from the IP they go into um, like various, again, various steps all the way up to the operating system. So every one of these steps you have queuing, you have processing, you have like all this variance that can get added basically to the system. To avoid all these problems, uh, something basically is added to the, uh, to this layer between like end of layer one to layer two, which is called hardware timestamping. And that is basically the bread and butter for uh, PTP. So in addition, uh, like timestamping, right? You're stamping basically the packet uh, on like with time, in other words, you have a timer and you're capturing the time when a packet arrives or a, a packet uh, like leaves. But what is this timer? So this timer, uh, instead of just relying on the um, like good old fellow real time clock, we have a new uh, thing introduced in PTB called PHC, physical hardware clock. And physical hardware clock is basically Again, according to IEEE, so by the way, PTP uh, is also like uh, make interchangeably, they call it also IEEE 1588. And uh, so it, it's an IEEE standard. So going back to uh, based on IEEE 1588 standard, uh, the PHC is an 80 bit register, which uh, 48 bits of it is seconds and 32 bits of it is subseconds. So 
32 bits takes you down to 250 picoseconds because like 30 bits is billion, uh, let's say one nanosecond. And now we have two more. So you, you have the resolution of um, uh, 250 picoseconds. However, the clocking of the increments that you get in a, in a PTP uh, enabled network, they're about eight nanoseconds. And again, that varies also uh, to uh, between, uh, let's say, vendors. That's why we have something like this time appliances project where we are trying to bring everyone in and unify like all these uh, standards together in addition to what we have in IEEE and ITU. So um, the, the time, basically, you have like uh, uh, between a master clock, a time packet, traveling through the network, getting to the, like, we no longer call it slave clock, we're calling it ordinary clock for all the right reasons. So as the packet travels through the network, you have like this um, hops or like buffering and all the congestion and everything. And uh, the, you, as you can see, like, uh, not only, like the hardware time stamping, uh, takes care of, let's say, um, the buffering that you have in the master clock and let's say the ordinary clock. But in between, you may have also some delays and everything. So something has to, some other mechanisms should also, in addition, basically help this, uh, uh, the travel for the packet over the network. So uh, as the, let's say, these time packets, like, the, uh, the, like they travel through the network, we have, uh, like basically you have the accumulation of these um, uh, uncertainty in the accuracy, which we are calling it packet delay variation or PDV. And the PDV keeps increasing as you go basically from hop to hop. So in order to um, uh, like take care of this, again, like the, we have two methods. We have the peer-to-peer -peer and we have like an end-to-end -end, uh, mechanism, which I will go through something relatively simple here um, of how, uh, how uh, in general, like, um, like the round trip delay is calculated. And this is not unique to PTP. NTP also uses this to a certain extent, but NTP doesn't have the hardware time stamping. Therefore, it cannot get the accuracies that the PTP gets. So you basically have uh, mas the master clock sending uh, like a payload of the current time to the ordinary clock. Ordinary clock receives the payload. In addition, it stamps the, the arrival of the packet with, uh, with, the, with the PHC that it got itself. Then the, like the ordinary clock sends a packet, which this packet is called actually a delay request to the master clock. And then master clock, and then at the moment it sends it basically, it stamps the departure time. And the master clock, captures the arrival time on its own end and it sends back basically T4 to the ordinary clock. So with having T1, which T1 was the payload, T2 was the arrival time, T3 was the departure of the delay request, and then uh, T4 was sent with another packet called delay response. With these four uh, values, you can basically calculate the offset. Offset is like, how much do I need to adjust? and delay. So in this case, like you see here in green and blue, in green, let's say master clock was at 100, whilst, while the ordinary clock was at 104, four seconds off. And uh, this, like uh, the delay is about a second, you see, like it takes one second for the packet to go through. And again, the assumption here is symmetry. It means like going forward and coming back is the same thing. That's why like, this divide by two is here. But in reality, usually this is not the case because packets may face different um, like because you have again you have a um, asymmetry and asynchronicity in the system and you may not have always this but this is a fair assumption and um, like there are again there are more techniques smarter techniques that they take care of this and with going through this you find the delay the delay and offset so you see like the, the offset is here uh, correctly calculated as four while the delay is like one so there are some smarter methods, let's say in PTP, like the end-to-end, -end, that's what we're using. We send the first packet, but then we send a follow-up when the packet basically left, like the, because we have also the layering and everything. We have also like the buffer for the switch and everything. So as a packet, here the application decides to send a packet. 
Over here, the packets get sent. So it takes, it to, it take in this, in this example, we have like one second that it takes before the packet gets sent. So sync zero goes, a follow-up goes after it. So then you have more accurate uh, T1 and T2. Uh, T2 I make, uh, remains the same, but T1 becomes more accurate. Then on the arrival, we have the same thing, like basically T4 gets uh, captured at this point and then gets sent. So you have like, again, the, pretty much the same results, but like you, with this mechanism, you have an addition of this follow-up packet, but you have better accuracy. But then now uh, I will uh, go forward. I don't want to spoil it here. We're not going to just take this value and then adjust or clock and call it a day. Instead, we'll do something smart. You will see now. So. Uh, in addition to uh, this mechanism that you saw, like it's like, uh, between two machines, because we are dealing with a network, we may have more hops and then more switches. So the switches are also uh, doing this hardware timestamping, and they will also add some more features to this, uh, like uh, to this uh, PTP architecture. So these features are basically. One, one of them is called transparent clock and one's a boundary clock. So in short, what they will do is the following. A transparent clock will act in a way as if it doesn't exist. So basically as a packet arrives to a transparent clock, it gets a um, ingress timestamp and right before it leaves, it gets uh, basically the, uh, like a, uh, a correction there is a field in the pack in this uh, sync and then uh, like delay request, delay response packets. There's a field called um, uh, correction. Like, so in the correction, we put the residence time that the packet basically had in that switch. So that is called transparent clock. And then you don't need to interact with the transparent clock. The packets will basically just get this adjustments automatically as they hop through the switch. In addition to this, if you're talking to about, let's say, uh, a network with millions of uh, servers, it will be a little bit of next to impossible if every one of these machines are trying, to, they're basically are trying to uh, synchronize with one grandmaster. You will have the one point of failure problem, you will have less often updates, uh, and you name it. Instead, what you do is like you, you sprinkle like this, the boundary clock job to some of these switches. So these boundary clocks on one end, they act as an ordinary clock. They sync with the master. They have a fairly good clock inside themselves and they act as a master now from the other side. So you can basically make these hierarchies. I always uh, make this example here, like uh, when I present it in Facebook. So it's like you have your manager and imagine instead of a manager, if your manager was just like, just a messenger, and then you have to uh, like always, let's say, uh, communicate directly with a CEO. So because let's say, I don't know, we have like a 50,000, let's say employees, that's gonna take forever. Like a just simple math that if the CEO wants to have a half an hour session for every person and eight hours a day, five days a week and no holidays, uh, it's going to take something about 20 years to basically check with everyone. And after 20 years, you basically start from the beginning and then you already are off 20 years. So instead, what you do is you put these managers and then the managers, instead of like him, like basically looking for uh, communicating with 20,000 people, he communicates, let's say, with five, 10, uh, let's say, I don't know, uh, like uh, directors or something and VPs, directors and so on. And then you have more time, you can communicate, you can synchronize basically with your manager every week. So this is basically like the definition of a boundary clock. So ordinary clock, as we said, like is basically the consumer and transparent clock is acts like in a way that it doesn't exist. And I make the, how, like we don't need to get into the mechanism, how it's in, internally, but it just basically looks for the ingress and then adds the egress as it goes through. And the boundary clock, as I said, it terminates it in one end and then acts as if it is like the master clock from the other side. Um, and I mean, the mechanism. And like, there are also like some states, which again, this is more technical, like when it comes to PTP, like you go between synchronization and so on. So this is what I was going to uh, talk about. Like when I said, uh, we take that synchronization 
but we don't apply it immediately. Instead, like when I said we're doing it smart, right? Instead of, let's say, remember we had the grandmaster at 100 while the ordinary clock as, what as, was at 104. And then we did like basically that round trip and everything. We figured out, okay, we are like four, four seconds off. We don't apply that four second immediately. Instead, what we do is we run it into a, a PI controller. So in a PI controller, I make, if you want to just uh, make it fancy, sure, it's a PI controller. But I make if you want to just go in a layman language, you basically are taking a proportion of that error and you apply that. Let's say we figured out that, oh, we are, uh, let's say, um, point, uh, sorry, four seconds off. So instead of applying that four seconds, let's say if we have a KP of, let's say, uh, 0.7, we go, let's say, uh, uh, 2.8 seconds. We adjust only 2.8 seconds. And we keep running this loop over and over again. And slowly we get basically to that point. Why? Well, uh, Dr. Kinsner is here. You can ask him. Probably he will give you a better answer. So there is a Gaussian distribution assumption. And actually, it's pretty fair, actually, when I just take like the values from the network, they tend to have a, a very good like Gaussian distribution over like these delays and everything. So a Gaussian distribution uh, will assure you that you will like with an iteration, you will eventually like uh, close up like the like the wiggle around the centroid of this and slowly like you get, you, you start getting like a better results. And then in order to avoid these um, like the uh, steady state errors, we have also an integrator there. And the integrator tries to make it, basically tries to make it uh, so that the steady state error goes away. We don't have a, like a, the D, the, the dif like differentiator. So uh, however, I make, I've, been, I've been playing around with this and we're looking for more smarter like methods to do this. But today, as we're talking today, like with, with the last revision even PTP had in 2019, this is the standard thing we have right now. We have like just a PI controller and they're calling it actually a PIC, uh, like PI controller, so <laughs> pretty weird. So um, again, a little bit more into the basics of oscillators. Again, like this probably we don't need to uh, dig more that, a lot into it. So oscillation is basically a physical phenomena of like something fluctuating. Oscillator is a circuit that takes advantage of that. And uh, like you have also the characteristics of the shape and everything and so on, like I don't know. And now you have clock. Clock is basically an integrator of the oscillation. So it's, uh, it's a counter. And so uh, with this, we have different types of oscillators that I make mean, prior to uh, joining Facebook and working on this project, all I knew was crystals, and I knew a little bit about the TCX. So again, thanks to Dr. Kinsner with the AMSATS project, which uh, TCXO stands for Temperature Compensated Crystal Oscillator. So it turns out that, uh, like again, because oscillation is a physical phenomena, and uh, usually it's a mechanical, uh, like in oscillators and crystal oscillators, it's a mechanical vibration. So a lot of things. Uh, uh, affect the accuracy of your clock. And keep in mind, like I work on time and I've been like right now working on it for three and a half years. And to be honest, we're not even working on quote unquote time. We are just trying to synchronize two independent or like more uh, systems with each other in a way that we don't need to communicate all the time to know like uh, like the 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 synchronization. I mean, we we have like this underlying thing, but I mean, all the time is like we're not doing a billion times a second. We're doing it, let's say, uh, uh, like I don't know, sixteen times a second for every machine with this hierarchy. So we can run transactions that are like billion times a second. Like I don't know, so we can have those transactions uh, saving this synchronization, and they can do their uh, operations more efficiently. So again, these uh, clocks, they come also in uh, different forms. And again, uh, they have pros and cons and you pick them based on their applications. So the interesting ones for me are like basically these atomic clocks. So we have, again, here we have another comparison. It's very interesting, like with clocks, the accuracy is described with uh, parts per million or parts per billion. 
and um, uh, yeah, you can see like as you go down, like again, more expensive, you get into this world of like oven control crystal oscillators and rubidium uh, atomic clocks and uh, like cesium clocks, like these numbers also go pretty insane. Like uh, also the aging uh, becomes another factor. Like, um, like although let's say see for the cesium clock, you have all these uh, beautiful numbers, but cesium clocks tend to live something between five to 10 years, if not like 15 years. And that's because the tube is uh, like, I have, I have a little bit more, I'll explain it while we get there. So we have two terms that we are using here in, um, in uh, synchronization. Again, synchronization and synchronization. So synchronization is you set the time, let's say uh, time, we call it also TOD, time of the day. So you set the time, but synchronization is you setting the frequency. It means that I set the time with you, let's say at 12 o'clock, great. And then five seconds later, I check again and I look at how much drift we got. Instead of just like blindly, just like updating the time over and over and over again, I will try to trace how off you are incrementing or decrementing, like basically the increments. Like I'll check the increments, how the increments are doing. And I try to tune those increments. So in an event that you, look, the communication between us is lost, uh, we can have a better holdover. And holdover is like how long you can, uh, stay within a range that is acceptable. And let's say in a case of, let's say, boundary clock, it's no longer just your time, it's all the constituents that you are providing as you are like sitting, let's say, in this hierarchy. So there is also this notion of accuracy versus precision and stability. Again, we don't need to you know, dig too much into it for this presentation. Again, the oscillator and the time source, as I said, they, uh, they have this variations, let's say, based on temperature. And you see here we have the changes of frequency versus frequency. And like you have uh, the, these notions, as I said, like you have PPM so, or PPB. So you see as like for a crystal oscillator, you expect something between 50 to 10 PPM. When it comes to um, like TCXOs, you get like around the range of like, let's say, one PPM. And then OCXOs is like you go below, you go like in... Uh, in PPB world. And then again, we go further, rubidium, cesium, and so on. So again, this is about crystal oscillators. I don't know if you guys are interested, but I mean, they are quartz basically. And then depending on how they cut them, they have like different uh, characteristics, how the temperature changes and uh, like AT cut or Z cut or like, sorry, AT cut. And uh, there is another one that uh, I think we use more AT cut here. And uh, you have the short-term versus long-term stability. This one is actually very interesting. That it's like if you have something that is uh, pretty aggressive on the changes, like in short-term, to keep itself, let's say, within synchronization. The moment you lose the um, the connection, it tends to have a shorter long-term stability. It will go off quickly because it had all these aggressive changes opposed to if you have something that is pretty moderate as it goes through the short-term changes, it will have a better long-term stability because it always takes like these tiny adjustments. So we take advantage of this a lot, let's say in our systems. And again, the temperature compensator oscillator, again, they come also in different versions. Like usually they are a, a voltage controlled oscillator that you have it also with a temperature sensor and everything and the so there is a compensation network that takes care of the changes of the output based on the temperature changes. So uh, oven control, you basically take a, a crystal oscillator, you put it in an oven, and the oven tries to uh, maintain the temperature at a constant. So it will basically um, uh, make sure that the temperature changes are not that high so you will guarantee a better uh, stability and in some applications we have even a, a double oven it means like you have an oven outside and another oven I, ha I have a picture here yeah so this is a double oven like you have an oven here and another oven and then inside it you basically have the uh, oscillator so the oscillator basically will have a constant temperature you can also have a diy another ham fellow here uh, put basically a 
NTC, uh, temperature sensor with an <laughs> oscillator. So you can become very creative on that. <laughs> So a cesium clock used to look like this in the 70s. And uh, I mean, we don't need to dig that much into it. You have basically a ray of uh, cesium, uh, like you have a cesium vapor that you have a magnet that pulls basically the charged particle, just naturally 50-50 of these particles will be charged or not charged. And they go through uh, this um, uh, microwave oven. And the microwave oven keeps uh, like basically charge of these particles. And some of these particles, again, become again 50-50. Some of them with a magnet, they get deflected and some of them en end up in the detector. So the detector is connected like basically with not, with a not logic back to this uh, microwave emitter uh, oven. And this causes basically an oscillation of something about nine uh, megahertz, I forgot the number I used to. Oh, here, 91926317700. Yeah, I used to know this number. <laughs> so this is like a natural number you get like always from cesium atoms. So again, uh, you have them basically in smaller form factors down to something like this that we are using these days. It's pretty cool. Like, And, and again, this uh, effort is like, it's going on still like they have even, I don't know, Probably, Paul is not here. Paul would love to probably wear something like this. And like, I mean, there are efforts also to make them in chips. So um, a little bit into like the foundation of like, I don't know, time and everything like time error. So time error is basically, again, this is, if this is your reference clock and you have like basically these uh, like two incidences, you have five minutes plus or five minutes uh, negative. So there is one important thing here with, uh, with adjusting the clocks. It's pretty much a no-no, like if you have, uh, you're doing the synchronization to push uh, an ordinary clock back. Because if you do that, like the services that are running inside, let's say you have, you're taking derivatives or something, or like, I don't know, uh, orders or, and if you do like a subtraction, like you, you, you reduce basically the time, you may end up with, uh, a lot of crazy consequences. So instead what you do is you try to slow that machine down to put it align, unless the steps are really like, uh, like crazily off. And that's why we have like a state machine that takes care of this. So this is an example of, let's say, how uh, we do the measurements. Let's say from every one of these uh, appliances, we get this one PPS, one pulse per second. And we throw them, let's say, in an oscilloscope, you see how off they are from each other. And let's say in this case, I had something about uh, 15 nanoseconds off, you see, between two machines. So time itself, it's pretty interesting. Like the time error is, uh, we have like this formula, like this is, uh, I mean, it, it gives you like uh, the error in terms of a constant error. And then you have, remember the, from the syntonization, you have an error, like the first order error basically times T. This is more like velocity, right? And you have the random variance uh, variation, which is uh, which is more like an acceleration. And you have like this uh, cyclic uh, thing also that you, you can see. Most of we basically ignore these two terms, and we care only about like the synchronization, which is x zero, and the syntonization, which is y zero. So. Um, Again, the servo mechanism, we already went through it. So we have, we have also uh, this uh, topic of like, let's say, uh, depending on what speeds you wanna use, how you wanna have the network and so on, we call, we call all these settings PTP profile. So this profiles may vary for different standards. Like ITU has like, I don't know, about 18 of them. Uh, myself and uh, Michelle, my colleague, we are uh, working actually on, uh, on a data com profile, DC profile, we call it. And um, so the distributed, again, the dis in this distributed systems of data centers, like basically we have a master clock, which receives basically from the GNSS the time. And then you have uh, like this boundary clocks and transparent clocks, and then they deliver basically the time to the racks. And from there on, we basically go down to, uh, to every individual machine. So here, like, uh, I mean, uh, usually like I explain like one nugget of why we are doing like these things. Imagine 
just uh, for reference. Like imagine you have these two machines and uh, uh, these are servers and this is a storage unit and this is another server. And let's say these two machines, they are trying to write a value on address 22. So this machine tries to write 33. This one is trying to write 44. And the address already had a value 11. And this machine wants to read it. And in a hazy day, all these uh, machines put their requests in the same time, approximately same time in the network. You may end up with three different um, outcomes. You may read, like basically if you are this machine, right? You may read uh, address 22 with a value 11. That means you read before these packets arrived. Or you may read it after the first one makes the change. Or you may read after the second one made the change. Uh, so you don't have consistency. This is not okay if you're dealing with, let's say, applications that are sensitive. Let's say, uh, again, that I, I will go through some of them. Like. Uh, you, you're basically breaking something called linearizability. And in order to avoid this problem, what pretty much we're doing today is a little bit funny. So any one of these packets, as they arrive, you, two, you have two mechanisms. One mechanism is like when, the packet, when one of these requests arrive, you wait two times plus something of the worst network delay you can expect. And by that, you're basically trying to make sure that the whole network is flushed out as, you, as you're going through. Let alone, you're not considering, let's say, if a packet gets lost here. And then you basically, if nothing came up and you were the only requester, sure, your request gets executed. Another way which we're using it for more sensitive application is this. When a request comes in to, to write something, this machine asks everyone, every other machine in the network, to make a vote on that. Would you accept me to write this? And upon uh, the voting for, uh, for uh, more than 50% of the machines, this machine will do it if it takes a majority of consensus. And before even doing that, it has to announce to every machine that I'm going to do this. And again, more than 50% of the machines should say, yes, do it, and they will write it. So this is called Paxis, basically what I told you. And uh, you can see how crazy it is just for one simple write, how taxing on the network it can become. So in other words, as I said, like the events, they need to be arranged in this, uh, in this manner to basically give this order. So uh, opposed to this, if you have um, uh, the time, the physical clock basically accurate, more accurate than the network latency, then you can actually avoid this weight and go for something called zero, uh, commit zero weight. So let me give you an example. Imagine you and I, like we have two clocks and we are trying to, in order to get this commit zero weight, we need to serve, we need to serve this criteria, like basically fulfill like this um, criteria of uh, linearizability. So what this means is, if I send you a packet or you send me a packet and it contains the time that you send it to me, the time has to be always from the past. So it would, uh, let's say again, with, with an example probably makes it easier. So imagine I have a clock and, I, uh, and you have a clock and then we uh, have our clocks synchronized within two seconds from each other. Let's say I have it at 30, you have it at 32. And I send you a packet. And whenever I send you the packet, the network latency is bad. It's like five seconds. So I send you a packet at 30. You were at 32. So when you receive it, you'll be at 37. So you ch check my packet. You see 30. You're at 37. Everything is fine. So now the opposite. You send me the packet. You were at 32. I was at 30. When I receive it, I'm at 35. I check your packet. 32. I'm at 35. It's all OK. But now imagine that the network latency instead of five seconds is one second. So I send you, a, let's say 30, you're at 32, you receive it at 33, still fine. You're at 33 and you receive a packet from 30. But now check this. If you send me at 32, your time, I'm at 30, I receive that 31. And I check and I'm like, oops, there is time from the future. And this breaks basically linearizability. And if I have a problem like this, either I have to add all this artificial delay all the time, let's say 
you send me time, I send you time, doesn't matter how, when it arrives, I add another 10, sec 10 seconds to it, right? Or uh, I have to check again with all, all the other machines, he, like uh, this machine sent me 32, is that right or not? And so on, and then you always basically follow that. So we are, I mean, state of the art in industry for all this hyperscale, we are using the commit and wait. And just a rough calculation shows that we are waiting something about 80 to 100 times more than what it takes for writing. And that is basically alone shows how important it is to have this synchronization because you can do these things immediately. So um, again, there are more applications, let's say in power systems and uh, again, we don't wanna touch that that much, like in phasers, I don't know, they are uh, like more like in uh, stock market and, uh, again, like we have also this thing called like an error budget, which it's not very necessary here. And then we have also this time scale. One important thing I wanted to also uh, give you before, let's say, you know, as a takeaway from this uh, presentation, it's pretty interesting to know that every day the earth is slowing down, let's say 24 hours, basically slows down by something about one milliseconds. That's crazy because let's say, thousand milliseconds which is roughly let's say three years it turns to one second so we have to add that one second in our system we call it leap second and the like this year we didn't have most likely 2021 we're going to have that and it, basically we have uh, the tai the atomic time uh, that we are adding seconds to it to create utc and utc is basically what you are getting like in their systems and everything so again, these are like basically from uh, from the 60s or, yeah, onward, like all these, uh, like we didn't have that from the 70s we started. We basically start adding basically these uh, leap seconds. And uh, again, this was like a setup we had and uh, you can see how basically over time it got evolved. And uh, again, this is like more internal things. I don't, I make mean, this, there's nothing special. Like we have it all published in, uh, in different conferences. So this was my garage setup, and this happened only because of the coronavirus. So <laughs> if your DME conference went online, we did also a lot of crazy things. And this was pretty much before the coronavirus, and this is after, like, I don't know, this is like just last week. Look, this we're calling this time machine. We do all these experiments on it. I was gonna talk about these things a little bit, pretty, because again, uh, I know like you, uh, with Zara, like you have all this, amazing circuits in BME. We have also some interesting circuits that we use for uh, time to digital conversion, basically. We call them TDCs. And again, probably I'll just share with you these, these slides and you can go through them. It's pretty interesting, like how you can measure time basically with these circuits. And yeah, they come in different versions and colors and <laughs> applications and so on. So um, um, jumping into the conclusion, distributed systems can benefit a lot from synchronized time. And uh, PTP basically doesn't need an additional network. You can just use the existing network. I'm not uh, asking you guys to go and uh, push uh, Aurora or some, whatever was like a, <laughs> to have PTP. So when you are <laughs> when you are like I don't know uh, checking your classes or something registering for a class, it was super accurate. <laughs> so server mechanisms are very essential uh, parts basically of PTP and. Um, like PDV is always something we want to minimize as we go through packets. UTC uh, is an arbitrary time scale because we add always a leap second. Today, the leap second is about 37 seconds. Like basically 37 seconds we added or quote unquote 37 seconds, the earth slowed down last 50 years. And uh, um, time aware networks basically can manage like uh, queue congestions much more efficiently. Yeah, that's it. And we have like a lot more stuff, like if anyone interested. Here you go, press escape and give back the share screen. <laughs> Thank you, Ahmed. You're welcome. Indeed. Um, if everyone unmute the microphone, we can clap. Oh, no, you don't need to clap. A question, let's see. <laughs> okay, for questions, sure. I like to answer questions. I'm sure that everybody, uh, some people, especially the Kinsner may have some questions. 
Sure. The room is open. Please unmute and uh, also put your cameras back if you have a question. If I knew there are no questions, I would have I would have started a little bit uh, with the with the TDC circuits. I love TDCs. They are wonderful. They are basically they teach they, they teach you to do certain things that you're not supposed to do in a normal day. Mm. <laughs> they used to basically they can give you picosecond measurements, and we're using them in in our hardware. May I ask a, a, a quick question? For sure, for sure. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, for, for uh, that very interesting talk. Uh, time is so precious and so important. Um, so femtoseconds would be better. Um, <laughs> and maybe to go into deep or even sub pico, if uh, at one point you talked about uh, some innovative thinking of how to do how to do the how to manage the oscillators, uh, and you uh, you used a PI where this integer order. Uh, uh, if uh, please consider fractional order uh, PI and PID, and then you would be able to uh, speed up and get to optimality beyond the uh, limitations of an integer order PI. It would be probably not great, but it would provide you flexibility and eliminating the errors that you you are stuck with in uh, in the integer order. Sure. But, uh, so the, the quest for femtoseconds at some femto. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Will continue I mean, it, it, because it, it, of the synchronization of the networks is, will become more and more important. I think. Like in, in Thank you. Uh, the, the thing is like with the, with the synchronization, uh, it is very interesting. Like for example, we have, we have systems that they, that they can give you, let's say uh, digits, like single digits nanoseconds. And we, on purpose, we go and loosen them up a little bit and we make them go like in tens of hundreds of nanoseconds because the best that we, like the best uh, latency we get in our networks, we have to just be better than the, the network latency to go for zero, zero weight basically, uh, is something about one, uh, like what well, five, one, like 1.5, 1. 1. yeah, 1.5 uh, microseconds. So we just, if we are within, let's say 500 nanoseconds, we are fine. So that's why we loosened up some of these things again, because we found that there is a interesting relationship between uh, um, long-term stability and short-term stability. However, right now we're using a hundred gig network. Soon we are moving to 200 or 400 is pretty much ready. We're just like going to sort of final like uh, testing and everything. And then let's say once we introduce let's say 400 gig network, then that network latency, latency drops to uh, 200 nanoseconds. Okay, now from <laughs> from a loose criteria, now we have to go back to deeper and deeper. So let's say by the time we go for 800 nanoseconds, so 800 gigabits per second, definitely we need to tap into, let's say, picosecond. And this, like basically we are in a race. We are already ahead 10 times better than the speed of the network, like the latency, but that doesn't mean we will stay there because technology is also advancing. So it's pretty interesting. Like, <laughs> We are like in a race, as I said, like constantly trying to get our time better. Any other question? I see Greg here. Yeah, your buddy is here. Yeah, Adam, before buddy. anybody asks any technical question, I have a sort of non-technical question. Is sure. leap seconds, is yeah. it constant, you think? So um, we, Every, uh, like the ITA with the UTC has a meeting in December 10th that they will look at like how off we are right now, let's say from, uh, I don't know, from the uh, TAI. So TAI has been running nonstop from the 70s for 50 years. And we are always like basically measuring these two. And then there is an entire uh, event. We will go through a 12 hours event that we ask everyone to shut down all their non-essential services and everything and we smear basically this one second it's very interesting like we we add this error to all our clocks so the clocks slowly go up and then we meet everyone on the one second 
So this year we were like so relieved that the, we were like, I think about 80%, like close to hitting the thing. And we were like, okay. And we, we attended like live because this is the most important thing for us. And the uh, ITA said, okay, no leap second for 2020. <laughs> Go enjoy. <laughs> but, but definitely, they said definitely there will be one in 2021. So now this is what you brought up. It's actually very interesting. So China made this uh, dam that is going to use basically the like the tide and uh, like basically tide dam, right? So we're assuming that uh, things like this will definitely slow down the, the spin of the earth. So mm. a lot of it is TBD, but uh, it is also very scary. Like, I mean, global warming, I mean, I'm watching the sky is crazy how it looks like in California. But mm -hmm. uh, this the slowdown of the earth is also very serious. <laughs> mm. it, if we slow down, like, I mean, climate change, everything will affect that as well. Like, so yeah. <laughs> earth slowing down is serious. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> and it's pretty mm. fast, like one millisecond a day. Like, that's 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 a lot you know it's relatively fast yes so apparently it used to be mm. much less i don't know like it so it means if it was much less it means it's gonna get worse i don't know it's just it's it's another mysterious thing we're we're tapping into like i don't know or or mm -hmm. planet like you know like this um like we're persian like from khayyam uh, he calculated basically the the, uh, the length of a year uh, mm -hmm. down to 12 digits and mm -hmm. then like later on like with new technology you see all the way up to five digits of it is correct the rest of it is not and the rest of it actually because of wiggle and actually the slowdown of the earth and so many other factors like you don't have that accuracy that much there and the five digit actually puts you down to that one microsecond so mm -hmm. sorry, that one millisecond so interesting right it is indeed Okay, I guess maybe your buddy Greg has a question. Yes. Greg Enric is here too. I, I see, see that. I see that. It's, a, it's an Amsat's get together here. Can um, you hear me? Get together, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, one thing I'm curious because you're, you're, you're diving into the world, and thank you very much for uh, putting it in the context of why you care about time so much in order to uh, facilitate uh, a large volume of transactions and order of operations of those transactions. Um, for these timing systems, how much are they dependent on um, GNSS as a reference clock? Very good, very good question. Very good question. Because, like we, because we have this footprint all over the globe, uh, make we have like, we have a lot of numerous reports. Like I don't know, Putin goes around and there is like a security team around him that they're jamming like all the signals. Or this is very true. And we have let's say that data centers in Europe, so like we don't want to have like a problems like this to occur. So what that that's the reason why we have atomic clocks. So what happens uh, in uh, in that in that master note, the grandmaster is. The grandmaster listens to the uh, to the GPS, and it uses something uh, called uh, like disciplining. It's called uh, clock disciplining algorithm. So what? And, and then this comes like in a lot of versions, and like I, I, I'm like I'm working with my colleagues on our own implementation that is uh, digital, but let's say they are like the our, our colleagues in CERN, they have their own version for White Rabbit that is basically based on a VCO. So what you do is you look for the, uh, you look for the GNSS, GNSS gives you this PPS output. And then you try to snapshot basically the uh, a, a counter that is fed by your atomic clock. And then you see how off you are from a second, either you are too, too, like too fast or too slow or like something in between. And you put that value back into trimming this, uh, like the pulse. Let's say in, in case of a VCO, it's pretty simple. Then you add a little bit into the VCO. In our case that we're making a digital, remember I said, we have 32 bits in our, in our uh, PHC and uh, we, our increments are eight nanoseconds. Eight nanoseconds, 125 uh, megahertz. So we take the 10 megahertz, we turn it to 125 and that's our increments. But now the increments are supposed to be uh, let's say the first five bits, right? You're gi giving the value, let's say, uh, 16, right? So instead of 16, you give it 15, or you give it 17, and you try to tune your uh, clock with what the GPS is. 
So when the GPS is there, you try to, uh, like you build a history of how good your uh, clock is with respect to the GPS. Once the GPS is gone, and the GPS systems that we use are very smart, how they're like multiple of them, and they are all like they have to sync, they have to have consensus with each other on the same box, then they will do the discipline for the atomic clock. If one of them fails, they all go off and the atomic clock keeps going. But the notion to that, what we did is this. Because the networks, all these grandmasters in different data centers, they're all working with each other and they have atomic clocks. And then in a, in a good day, the GPS is available to all of them. They are snapshotting uh, from their PHC, the values that they get either from GPS or from the uh, atomic clock. Then they send all these, uh, like their snapshots to, to each other, all of them. Like basically you make a matrix. And in that matrix, you have the difference basically between each one of them. And that difference has to always stay minimal. If that matrix, if, if let's say one machine gets like uh, spoofed for whatever reason, that value will basically show itself off because you have, let's say, know, 20 data centers and all the 20, they are always in sync. And these errors are always within, let's say, I don't know, uh, 10 nanoseconds. If one of them goes up, you know, okay, that one is wrong. R right away, that machine knows that it has to basically follow one of these machines or worst case, it tells everyone that, hey, no real time, go back into logical clock. And all these like, uh, uh, I'll call them stupid uh, methods that we're using in distributed system, they will kick in better than nothing because we always have this fallback method. Like we always fail over on the, on the old method if things are, what, what, what I find fascinating about that is it's effectively you've built what is an open community version of what they actually do for the GPS satellite systems themselves because yes. their cesium and rubidium clocks yes. floating at, uh, in, or, in orbit at 20,000 kilometers up yes. and they have to be calibrated and referenced and there's a huge volume of people who have to maintain those satellite systems and their clock reference and they build a grid so that they can figure out the time in the same way. So you've kind of built a redundant clock yes. system. to. So to we are trying it. to have also one node now in Boulder so uh, basically that one is connected to the uh, American uh, time, American military time or something they call it. We're trying to put, let's say, also with other colleagues, let's say, we're, we're looking into it. That's why we're looking into this um, uh, TAP. Uh, so from OCP, we're trying to reach out basically all of them and we have like something much, much beyond Facebook. Like all, all these, like, I don't know, uh, hyperscale services, they all talk to each other and then uh, security also comes in. Like if you're not a legitimate service, like an intruder, good luck, a hacker, great. You may in, get in, you don't have your atomic clock. You're not connected to our system. You're not gonna get anywhere without it. So encryption based on time is also a very, very big topic that we're looking into. Like it makes it next to impossible. Like unless if you wanna intrude, you have to go and get into a data center, take basically a steering wheel and from there like hack everyone. But <laughs> that's not going to work like that. So, <laughs> and then you'll be found as an outlier because there is a consensus across everyone. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Oh my Any God. Any other off time. quick question? <laughs> I have a quick question on that topic. I'm just wondering about gravitational waves and if you need this kind of technology. Yes. Yes, I, I'm so thankful you brought it up. So because we have uh, the accuracy going down to, uh, to picoseconds, like I mean, theoretical, we can do it in down to picoseconds. We're actually trying to see if we see anomalies in certain, let's say places, if we can relate it back into like, uh, let's say in some nanoseconds somewhere else. So we are looking into making some modification. Again, uh, we always have to justify like the business need we have a hard time with that, but just out of curiosity, we're looking into that. But I mean, the changes are very minute, but uh, we are actually looking into it uh, somehow. Like it's because we have like uh, fellows from the LIGO project. So it is very interesting. Like this, the, t the time family is pretty small, I would say. Okay. And like there is a uh, question on the text. Can you please look at the chat? and read the question. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Oh, there's chat. Okay. Click on chat. 
and read it first and then answer please. okay is it okay to ask the question by okay no 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 the yeah. bottom the last message uh, okay i want to ask about remote sensor network operating in environments where access to dedicated wire connection is not feasible okay so i'll tell you the story so um with the method that i explained that these um the system they basically receive the pps and then they check with each other you, you, we, you can do it wireless. As a matter of fact, we did, we did the test with wireless because we needed a bad network. We were trying to do it in the lab first. So the first step we did in wireless and it, it was working. It was working pretty well because the snapshots you get from the PHC is uh, driven from an uh, input you get from the GNSS. And then from there on, you basically forward this packet in a non-time sensitive way and it goes to one packet, one machine that the PHC of that machine is synchronized, let's say, with your reference clock, atomic clock. And then that one basically disseminates back, or just gives back to you, responds back the, the offset. And then you take that offset and you do basically, again, you can run again the PI controller or anything smarter, and then you do the correction. And then you constantly will just do these transactions as you go through. So this is possible with this method. However, if your question is about, let's say, existing, um, let's say, 802.11 uh, protocols, Wi-Fi, like all these things, apparently there was a problem between just the governing body, literally a people problem, which uh, with the timing team, and they did not integrate that. However, in newer uh, Wi-Fi protocols like uh, 11AC, the time is coming back in, so we are having time stamping also in wireless. In wireless, it's so much more efficient, in my opinion, to go with time stamping rather than just relying on RSSI alone. That will allow us to do measurements of the uh, time of flight, and then you can do like much more, uh, let's say, much more efficient uh, timing and localization. Did, did uh, let's see, what is that? Okay. So radar, radar, um, again, I am not very familiar with, uh, like I don't know, military applications or something, but to a certain extent, I know that uh, some of, like uh, the, there are some applications that they use basically the accuracy that PTV brings for you, why? So the, uh, when you work, let's say, I don't know, in these, uh, let's say, synthetic aperture or like methods where you have like a distributed system with a lot of receivers and you're trying to track down where, I don't know, certain things are, are coming. I don't necessarily, not necessarily just terahertz, not familiar that much with that. But let's say if you are trying to do, let's say some sort of uh, uh, security or something, you're trying to see like where you try to, find a phase like which like I don't know which receives are receiving something uh, and what phase so they can track down the angle of something coming in uh, or like you're trying to try and triangulate something um, uh, and nanoseconds will be enough definitely PTP can be a good uh, way to start with because let's say if you want to just use simply just cables that is not going to give you that much of a speed considering you lose like you have like say i don't know uh, about f five nanoseconds for per foot or something and while with ptp you can go back to let's say i don't know 10 10 nanoseconds and you are uh, much faster just uh, like in terms of like the accuracy for the clock than just a simple wire so I don't know if that answers. Greg, we can, I don't know, discuss this more in details if you like. Well, you're welcome, Chase. Hi, um, Pavel, thank you for the talk. Um, I just had a question. Um, I was reading the best master clock algorithm and how that plays into the hierarchy selection of the clocks. Is there one grandmaster clock in each data center or how does that work? Yeah, that's a very good question. So best master clock uh, is a method to make the, like in, in our data centers, first let's, let's break your question into uh, different answers basically. So the, uh, in our data centers, we have one uh, grandmaster, 
but we have two backups. One of them is the des like basically the next backup, and the third one is basically uh, the backup of the backup. So, and you have to have always, let's say, uh, two of them alive, ready. So if one of them is down for maintenance, you're still fine. If two are down, then you have to go for like a different alert or there are a lot of like, I don't know, things that, you know, we're sussing them out as we go through. Um, the best master clock, we don't use it dynamically in our system. Rather, the master clocks in their own hierarchy, they figure out which one should be like the master, uh, the, the main one, or like basically be a follow. So to, to the other machines, because we're using a unicast system, the IP addresses will basically define who is the master clock. In the best master clock algorithm, uh, you, the, the, it's the responsibility of the ordinary clock or boundary clock. It's usually for the boundary clocks. It's the responsibility of that clock to determine which channel, if there are multiple master clocks coming in, to listen. And what you do is like there are multiple things, like there are, there are certain parameters that are uh, keyed into the protocol itself that let's say if one of them has an atomic clock, the other one has, let's say, well, I have a cesium clock, one has a rubidium clock, one has like the OCXO, they will have a different number and that number determines their priority. But that is completely like determined by hand. And on top of that, some more smart, like best master clock algorithms, they look for the variations, how much variation you're getting or how much consensus you're getting. So they apply more into ITU where you don't own the entire network. You have appliances, let's say for example, in telecom, you have part of the network, I don't know about Rogers and I don't know, all these vendors you have there. Let's say Rogers has something. And by the way, 5G is all with PTP. Like uh, it's next to impossible to run 5G without PTP. So the 4G was using PTP. Whenever it had PTP, it was more efficient. Without PTP, it was able to work. So IT went through a lot of evolution to get there. So to answer again, uh, specifically your question, in our system, we don't, have, we don't use that. We're using it a different way. Basically, the IP gets uh, released. It's basically, uh, it's a lease and it gets released. So, and then another one basically takes over. And uh, where is it used mainly? It's used in ITU where you have a very um, uh, heterogeneous uh, like network and hardware and like you don't own everything and that's why you need to have uh, like a way to see which, which master clock you should follow. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. And for everyone, if you are interested in this topic, we have these bi-weekly meetings every Wednesday to Winnipeg time, it will be 1 p.m., 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Last Wednesday, we had one, and uh, not this coming, the one after, we'll have the next one. If you wanna uh, just attend the meetings, it's just like, you can, it's like a go meeting thing. And if you wanna find the link, just uh, uh, type ocptap.com. And then you will basically get to our page and then go to the wiki and then you have like all the meetings also recorded. The, so far we had, I think, five meetings, like previous meetings, you can attend that. So we made this tap for basically bringing the entire community together of like, I don't know, time and everything. If you're interested, like I highly recommend you attend. Yes, ocptap.com, yes. Hey, Ahmed, I would like to thank you again. You're welcome. It was indeed a pleasure to have you speak. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure uh, getting um, back to all my colleagues. It was, it was such a like, nice thing to see Greg and Emrick and <laughs> Dr. Kinsner. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you in person sometime. Not for sure, far. for sure. We'll try my best. <laughs> yeah. Whenever the border opens, I'm in Winnipeg. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Winnipeg oh, is yeah. always, will always welcome you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. everyone. And see you in uh, two weeks. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All Bye, the best. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay healthy. Thanks. Bye.